Hey folks, here we are for the final chapter of the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Henry Jekyll's full statement of the case. We just finished chapter 9, which was Dr. Lanyon's letter, uh, in which it's the big reveal, right, that, that Hyde and Jekyll are the same person, that, um, you know, uh, Lanyon has to go to Jekyll's house and get this drawer with the salt and this liquid in it, and he brings it back, and then Hyde shows up at his house and drinks it and turns into Jekyll, and oh my god, they're the same person. It was a, a huge smashing reveal to a uh, Victorian audience who had no idea, but to you, maybe you're familiar enough with the idea of Jekyll and Hyde that it's, it's not an a enormous surprise. However, that twist um, was, was definitely a really big deal. Um, However, there, we didn't answer all the questions, like, why did Lanyon have to go to Jekyll's laboratory himself and pull out this drawer? Why couldn't Jekyll do it? Um, and, you know, why did, why did Hyde have to reveal himself to Lanyon? Like, there's, there's a lot of sort of questions that remain to be answered, and this chapter is going to answer them all. Um, just like the last one, this one's an epistolary chapter. It is, uh, I think it was referred to as the confession of Henry Jekyll in chapter 8 when... Um, Utterson found it, but it's one of the two documents he took home to read. So this one is written not in Utterson's voice, not in Lanyon's voice, but in Jekyll's voice. So it's a brand new voice. You'll find that Jekyll is the smartest of the three of them, so he has the highest vocabulary. There's going to be some really, really big, um, eloquent uh, vocabulary words. Jekyll's a bit of a sesquipedalian. Yeah, look that one up. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll get that, but the voice is very different. So I'll, I'll put on my Jekyll voice and I'll read this. Um, it's actually going to rewind to before chapter one, before the story of the door, and it's going to take us through the whole process of Jekyll's failed science experiment and, and how and why it happened. So without further ado, Henry Jekyll's full statement of the case. Now I was born in the year 18 something, to a large fortune, endowed besides with excellent parts, inclined by nature to industry, fond of the respect of the wise and good among my fellow men, and thus, as might have been supposed, with every guarantee of an honourable and distinguished future. And, indeed, the worst of my faults was a certain impatient gaiety of disposition, such as has made the happiness of many, but such as I found it hard to reconcile with my imperious desire to carry my head high and wear a more than commonly grave countenance before the public. Hence it came about that I concealed my pleasures, and that when I reached years of reflection and began to look around me and take stock of my progress and position in the world, I stood already committed to a profound duplicity of me. So what he says here, I think, is that, you know, like he, he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He had money, he had a good position, he's attractive, he's got sort of everything going for him. Um, the only problem he has is a certain gaiety of disposition. He enjoys fun. He enjoys um, <laughs> I don't, nothing, nothing too terrible, uh, but things that might be embarrassing if they were to come out in the public. Um, and maybe the kind of stuff that Enfield does, you know, like uh, he enjoys getting drunk or he enjoys visiting an opium den now and again or, or a whorehouse or, or, or whatever. Um, you know, not, not murder or anything terrible. Uh, but he concealed his pleasures because he didn't want people to know that he was doing them. Uh, and so he became uh, duplicitous. Uh, he has sort of two sides to himself, and he's tricking himself and, and presenting only one side to the public. Many a man would have even blazoned such irregularities as I was guilty of, but from the high views that I had set before me, I regarded and hid them with an almost morbid sense of shame. It was thus rather the exacting nature of my aspirations than any particular degradation in my faults that made me what I was, and, with an even deeper trench than in the majority of men, severed in me those provinces of good and ill which divide and compound man's dual nature. This is an interesting idea. That, um, we're already starting to get a little bit of philosophy here. Uh, he suggests that every human being is composed of a province of good and a province of ill, and, and we have a dual nature. There's a good and a bad inside of everyone. In this case, I was driven to reflect deeply and inveterately on the hard law of life, which lies at the root of religion and is one of the most plentiful springs of distress. Though so profound a double-dealer, I was in no uh, sense a hypocrite. Both sides of me were in dead earnest. I was no more myself when I laid aside restraint and plunged in shame than when I labored in the eye of day at the furtherance of knowledge or the relief of sorrow and suffering. And it chanced that in 
that the direction of my scientific studies, which led wholly towards the mystic and the transcendental, reacted and shed a strong light on this consciousness of the perennial war among my members. With every day, and from both sides of my intelligence, the moral and the intellectual, I thus drew steadily nearer that to that truth, by whose partial discovery I have been doomed to such a dreadful shipwreck, that man is not truly one, but truly two. I say two because the state of my own knowledge does not pass beyond that point. Others will follow. Others will outstrip me on the same lines, and I hazard the guess that man will ultimately be known for a mere polity of multifarious, incongruous, and independent denizens. I, for my part, from the nature of my life, advanced infallibly in one direction and in one direction only. It was on the moral side and in my own person that I learned to recognize the thorough and primitive duality of man. So he suggests that, what did he say up here? Uh, that man is not truly one, but truly two. And that there is a primitive and thorough duality of man. In other words, every human being, every soul, is actually composed of two parts. One part good and one part evil. And these two parts are always in conflict. That's interesting. Um, Let's see, where was I? I saw that of the two natures that contended in the field of my consciousness, even if I could rightly be said to be either, it was only because I was radically both. And from an early date, even before the course of my scientific discoveries had begun to suggest the most naked possibility of such a miracle, I had learned to dwell with pleasure as a beloved daydream on the thought of the separation of these elements. If each, I told myself, could be housed in separate identities, life would be relieved of all that was unbearable. The unjust might go his way, delivered from the aspirations and remorse of his more upright twin, and the just could walk steadfastly and securely on his upward path, doing the good things in which he found his pleasure, and no longer exposed to disgrace and penitence by the hands of this extraneous evil. It was the curse of mankind that these incongruous faggots were thus born bound together, that in the agonized womb of consciousness, these polar twins should be continuously struggling. How, then, were they dissociated? Um, so, uh, this word, I guess I should, I should mention this word. We have a, a racial prejudice attached to this word. This, not racial. Um, sexual orientation prejudice attached to this word at the moment. The word actually means, and originally meant, a bundle of sticks. Um, usually used to, um, I don't know, uh, start a fire. So, uh, it, and then, I don't know, like, when you trace language and try and figure out why words that mean one thing come to mean something else, uh, it's, it's really interesting. And I, I looked this one up, and I was trying to figure out, like, how a bundle of sticks transitions into a sort of hateful and derogatory term for, for gay people. And uh, the closest I can come is that it meant a bundle of sticks, and then it came to mean the butt end of a cigarette that you would throw away. Uh, probably because it burns and it looks like a stick. And then it went from that to a derogatory term. So, uh, for what it's worth. Anyway, uh, what Jekyll is getting at here is that uh, there's two sides to his consciousness. And indeed, he thinks to every human consciousness. Everybody is, is composed of two bits in your soul, a good good soul and an evil soul, and they're trapped in your body, and you're only human because you're radically both of them at all times. And he starts to think about how great it would be if you could separate the two sides of the human soul. You could take the good and the evil apart, because the truth is that they're always ruining your life. Um, if you could just be good, then you could, let's, we'll use students at work, then you could do your work and be happy about doing your work. But you can't, because the evil side of you wants you to go to a party. And you're like, well, I can't go to a party because I've, I've got this, this paper to write for Mr. Howard, right? And so even if you went to the party, if you indulged the evil side or whatever and went off to this party, the entire time the good side would be making you feel guilty because you knew you had to write the paper. And so you wouldn't be able to have as much fun as you could because the good side is ruining the fun of your evil side. But if you say, stay, say, and decide to write the paper, then the whole time you're writing the paper, your evil side is like, that party's going on. And so you can't feel good about the good that you're doing because you know you're missing something that you could enjoy. And so that's that's a simple little example. Now, what if we could separate the two sides? Then you could just go off to that party and have a good time and have no guilt. Or if we could separate the good side, you could write the paper and not stress out about missing the party or whatever else it was that you wanted to do. And so this is Jekyll's dream, to somehow separate the two halves of the human soul so uh, that they can live in, in their own ways without 
worrying about each other. Anyway, how then, this is a rhetorical question, were they dissociated? That He's going to answer that question. I was so far in my reflections when, as I have said, a sidelight began to shine upon the subject from the laboratory table, that I began to perceive more deeply than it has ever yet been stated the trembling immateriality, the mist-like transience, of this seemingly so solid body in which we walk attired. Certain agents, I found, to have the power to shake and pluck back that fleshy vestment, even as a wind might toss the curtains of a pavilion. That's a simile. Uh, for two good reasons, I will not enter deeply into this scientific branch of my confession. First, because I have been made to learn that the doom and burden of our life is bound forever on man's shoulders, and when the attempt is made to cast it off, it but returns upon us with more unfamiliar and more awful pressure. Second, because as my narrative will make, alas, too evident, my discoveries were incomplete. Enough, then, that I not only recognize my natural body for the mere aura and effluence of certain of the powers that make up my spirit, but manage to compound a drug by which these powers should be dethroned from their supremacy, and a second form and countenance substituted, none the less natural to me because they were the expression and bore the stamp of lower elements of my soul. So, Jekyll says, uh, you know, he discovered a scientific compound, a potion. And if you drink it, it separates the two halves of your soul, and you can take the form of one of them. Uh, and this is pseudoscience, like there's no such thing. You can't change your physical form. But, you know, if, if your form, if your physical form is simply a manifestation, the physical manifestation of the representation of your soul, that's what, that's what Jekyll's suggesting. Um, then, you know, if you were to change your soul, it would change your physical form. And this is what he does um, when he takes a potion. He says, I'm not going to tell you about how I made the potion because I don't want you to make it and because it didn't really work the way I wanted it to. So this is very typical of science fiction, you know, like Frankenstein with Frankenstein's monster. Frankenstein's like, I don't want to tell you how I brought the monster to life because I don't want you to bring the monster to life either, right? Like this is how we, we basically the way science fiction writers write some of this, this stuff is it's more like magic than science. There's no actual process by which it could occur and therefore they have to disguise the process they make it sound scientific but they don't actually have the science to back it up uh, whatever the case um, this is more psychology than than um, you know hard science anyway uh, so he found this this potion he, he identified a potion and, and made it and it would separate the elements of his soul I hesitated long before I put this theory to the test of practice. I knew well that I risked death, for any drug that so potently controlled and shook the very fortress of identity might by the least scruple of an overdose, or the least inopportunity in the moment of exhibition, utterly blot out that immaterial tabernacle which I looked to it to change. But temptation of a discovery so singular and profound at last overcame the suggestions of alarm. I had long since prepared my tincture. I had purchased at once from a firm of wholesale chemists a large quantity of a particular salt, which I knew from my experiments, to be the last ingredient required. And late one accursed night I compounded the elements, watched them boil and smoke together in the glass, and when... I'm not going to remember how this word is pronounced. And when the ebullitions had subsided, with a strong glow of courage, I drank off the potion. So uh, there is a really important detail in here. He purchased at once from a firm of wholesale chemists a large quantity of a particular salt. We know that salt, right? Like this is the thing that, that Jekyll was trying to get uh, from all of the chemists in town. He was sending pool everywhere and all of the samples were impure. So that's going to be an important moment. Uh, but he makes the potion. We've seen him do this before. We saw it in the Lanyon chapter just a second ago. Um, he compounded the elements, watched them boil. Uh, and when the evolution stopped, um, he drank it. This is the first time he's drank the potion. The most racking pang succeeded, a grinding in the bones, a deadly nausea, and a horror of the spirit that cannot be exceeded at the hour of birth or death. These, then these agonies being swiftly to subside, I came to myself as out of a great sickness. There was something strange in my sensations, something indescribably new, and from its very novelty incredibly sweet. I felt younger, lighter, happier in body. Within I was conscious of a heady recklessness, a current of disordered sensual images running like a mill race in my fancy, a solution of the bonds of obligation, an unknown but not an innocent freedom of the soul. I knew myself at the first breath of this new life, be more wicked, tenfold more wicked, sold as a slave to my original evil, 
and the thought in that moment braced and delighted me like wine. I stretched out my hands, exulting in the freshness of these sensations, and in the act I was suddenly aware that I had lost in stature. Uh, he finds out that he's smaller and younger and feels lighter, but he's also a whole lot more evil. So, if Jekyll's theory is correct, and he's got a good side and an evil side, when he drinks a potion, what side comes out? Clearly the evil one. We're already starting to get an answer to what's going on here, uh, at least according to Jekyll. There was no mirror at that date in my room. That which stands beside me as I write was brought there later on, and for the very purpose of these transformations. So that explains the mirror. The night, however, however, was far gone into the morning. The morning, black as it was, was nearly ripe for the conception of day. The inmates of my house were locked in the most rigorous hours of slumber, and I determined, flushed as I was with hope and triumph, to venture in my new shape as far as to my bedroom. I crossed the yard, wherein the constellations looked down upon me. I could have thought with wonder. The first creature of that sort, with their unsleeping vigilance, had yet disclosed to them. What does he mean here, the first creature that the the constel of this sort the constellations had ever have ever seen well what he's saying here is that every human being at least according to his theory is made of a good part and an evil part but for the first time in the history of humanity Hyde Jekyll I don't know Jekyll has been able to shed his good part and be a hundred percent evil and of course this this probably answers some of those questions from earlier like um, Hyde feels deformed, but it's impossible to explain what his deformity is. Well, maybe his deformity is that he's evil, 100% evil. Everybody, even Hitler, has at least 1% good in him, uh, but because he's, he's human and all humans are made out of good and evil, but Hyde is 100% evil and the first, the first being of this kind that's ever existed in the world. Uh, anyway, where was I? Um... I could have thought with wonder, the first creature of that sort, that their unsleeping vigilance had yet discovered to them. I stole through the corridors, a stranger in my own house, and coming to my room I saw for the first time the appearance of Edward Hyde. I must here speak by theory alone, saying not that which I know, but that which I suppose to be the most probable. The evil side of my nature, to which I had now transferred the stamping efficacy, was less robust and less developed than the good which I had just deposed. Again, in the course of my life, which had been, after all, nine-tenths a life of effort, virtue, and control, it had been much less exercised and much less exhausted. And hence, as I think, it came about that Edward Hyde was so much smaller, slighter, and younger than Henry Jekyll. Pause. So, why is Hyde... 20-something years old, and dwarfish compared to Jekyll, who's a large 50-year-old man. Well, it's because the evil side of his personality was so much less exercised than the other one. Therefore, it had less time to mature, less time to develop. It wasn't as big. It was a smaller portion of his personality, and therefore it showed up as a smaller figure. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, where was I? Even as good shown upon the countenance of the one, evil was written broadly and plainly on the face of the other. Evil besides, which I must still believe to be the lethal side of man, had left on that body an imprint of deformity and decay. And yet, when I looked upon that ugly idol in the glass, I was conscious of no repugnance, rather of a leap of welcome. This too was myself. It seemed natural and human. In my eyes it bore a livelier image of the spirit. It seemed more express and single than the imperfect and divided countenance I had been hitherto accustomed to call mine. And in so far I was doubtless right. I have observed that when I wore the semblance of Edward Hyde, none could come near me at first without a visible misgiving of the flesh. This, as I take it, was because all human beings, as we meet them, are commingled out of good and evil, and Edward Hyde, alone in the ranks of mankind, was pure evil. Now, that's exactly what I was saying earlier. Um, I guess I jumped the gun on that. I lingered but a moment at the mirror. The second and conclusive experiment had yet to be attempted. It yet remained to be seen if I had lost my identity beyond redemption and must flee before daylight from a house that was no longer mine, and hurrying back to my cabinet, I once more prepared and drank the cup, once more suffered the pangs of dissolution, and came to myself once more with the character, the stature, and the face of Henry Jekyll. That night I had come to the fatal crossroads. Had I approached my discovery in a more noble spirit, had I risked the experiment while under the empire of generous or pious aspirations, all must have been otherwise, and from these agonies of death and birth, I had come forth an angel instead of a fiend. 
The drug had no discriminating action. It was neither diabolical nor divine, but it shook the doors of the prison house of my disposition, and like the captives of Philippi, that's an illusion, go look it up if you want to, that which stood within ran forth. At that time my virtue slumbered. My evil, kept awake by ambition, was alert and swift to seize the occasion, and the thing that was projected was Edward Hyde. Hence, although I now had two characters as well as two appearances, one was wholly evil, and the other was still the old Henry Jekyll, that incongruous compound of whose reformation and improvement I had already learned to despair. The movement was thus wholly toward the worse. All right, pause. I think this is an important passage as well. It turns out that um, Jekyll says that when he took the potion, he took it because he was ambitious and he wanted to be famous. And because that's an evil motive, ambition, the thing that was projected was Edward Hyde. If he had taken it under different circumstances and he had taken it feeling um, selfless and kind and positive and angelic form, the, the representation of his good side would have come out. But unfortunately, Hyde came out. And, and now that the evil side has realized that he can come out, um, it's never going to let the good side out or whatever. And so, therefore, um, he only has two personalities. He has Jekyll, who is, remember, half Hyde and half, I don't know, some, some very good version of Jekyll. And then he has Hyde, who's 100% evil. And so the, the transformation he claims that he has made is 100% for the worse. Uh, there is no better that comes out of it. Uh, anyway, even at that time, I had not conquered my aversions to the dryness of a life of study. I would still be merrily disposed at times, and as my pleasures were, to say the least, undignified, and I was not only well known and highly considered, but growing towards the elderly man, this co incoherency of my life was daily growing more unwelcome. It was on this side that my new power tempted me until I fell in slavery. I had but to drink the cup to doff at once the body of the noted professor, and to assume like a thick cloak that of Edward Hyde. I smiled at the notion. It seemed to me at the time to be humorous, and I made my preparations with the most studious care. I took and furnished the house in Soho, to which Hyde was tracked by the police, and engaged as a housekeeper a creature whom I knew well to be silent and unscrupulous. On the other side, I announced to my servants that a Mr. Hyde, whom I described, was to have full liberty and power about my house and square, and to parry mishaps I even called and made myself a familiar object in my second character. I next drew up that will to which you so much objected, so that if anything befell me in the person of Dr. Jekyll, I could enter on that of Edward Hyde without pecuniary loss. And thus fortified, as I supposed on every side, I began to profit from my strange immune from the sorry by the strange immunities of my position. All right, so <laughs> uh, you know, Jekyll never liked being a famous professor. Everybody expects it. I mean, he's, he's lived a duality of his life. He wants everybody to think the best of him. And so we put forward this elude. We're all, we're all guilty of this to some extent, the sort of the hypocrisy. We put forward the best version of ourselves to the public. We want people to think well of us. Um, but he also, as he says, has pleasures that are undignified. He enjoys doing things that are, that you can't brag about in public. Uh, you know, whether it's, it's, it, it never goes into detail as to what these things are. I'm guessing for, for Jekyll, his are a little worse than, than most people's. Most people will, you know, maybe get drunk on a Friday night once or, um, you know, become, I don't know, they have road rage or, or whatever. They have things that they try and hide about their personality. Um, but for Jekyll, it, it sounds like maybe he goes to opium dens and, and gets high or maybe he visits whorehouses or maybe he, I don't know, um, he, he does things that are undignified, that do not match the gravity of his public persona and public position. Um, and so he sees an opportunity to do these things as Hyde and never have it come back on him at all. Think about it. Uh, and it's also getting weird, like, especially if he's having one night stands with like college girls or whatever. Like, it's not so creepy when you're like, I don't know, 25 or 30, but when you're growing towards the elderly man, that becomes super weird and awkward, and you don't want to do that. So he's afraid that as he gets older, the expectation is that he's going to be better and better as a human being, and he's not going to be able to uphold that. But Hyde gives him the opportunity to go do these things and never have to worry about it. 
Um, so he makes plans. You know, he gets Hyde his own apartment. He gives Hyde a bank account. Uh, he makes people in his house know who Hyde is. He writes the will. So we're getting all the backstory here about how and why the events turned out the way they did. Um, however, let's see what he has to say. And men have before hired bravos to transact their crimes, while their own person and reputation sat under shelter. I was the first that ever did so for his pleasures. I was the first that could plod in the public eye with a load of genial respecti respectability, and in a moment, like a schoolboy, strip off these lendings and spring headlong into a sea of liberty. But for me, my impenetrable, in my impenetrable mantle, the safety was complete. Think of it. I did not even exist. Let me but escape into my laboratory door, give me but a second or two to mix and swallow the draught that I had always standing ready, and whatever he had done, Edward Hyde would pass away like the stain of breath upon a mirror. I like that he uses the mirror image here. And there, in his stead, quietly at home, trimming the midnight lamp, in his study, a man who could afford to laugh at suspicion would be Henry Jekyll. Ah, so... He can do whatever he wants as Hyde. This is the theme of anonymity. We talked about this earlier. Like in a big city, nobody knows who you are. You have no responsibility for your actions. But Hyde is an extreme case. He, he doesn't have a history. He doesn't have a family. He doesn't have friends. Nobody knows who he is. And when he turns back into Jekyll, he doesn't even exist. He's got this perfect hiding place. So what would you do if there were absolutely no repercussions? If you couldn't get caught, if you couldn't get blamed, if nothing could happen to you, what would you do? This is an interesting question. I think it, I think the, the story sort of begs that question. Um, so uh, that's, that's what he's got going on here. Uh, the pleasures which I made haste to seek in my disguise were, as I have said, undignified. I would scarce use a harder term, but in the hands of Edward Hyde they soon began to turn toward the monstrous. When I would come back from these excursions, I was often plunged into a kind of wonder at my vicarious depravity. This familiar, that I called out of my own soul, and sent forth alone to do his good pleasure, was a being inherently malign and villainous, his every act and thought centered on self, drinking pleasure with bestial avidity from any degree of torture to another, relentless like a man of stone. Henry Jekyll stood at times aghast before the acts of Edward Hyde, but the situation was apart from ordinary laws, and insidious, insidiously relaxed the grasp of conscience. It was Hyde, after all, and Hyde alone that was guilty. Jekyll was no worse. He woke again to his good qualities seemingly unimpaired. He would even make haste, where it was possible, to undo the evil done by Hyde, and thus his conscience slumbered. So, Jekyll, like, like he said, likes to do undignified things. Maybe he wants to go to an opium den, or maybe he wants to, I don't know, pole dance at a um, strip club. I don't know what he wants to do, but he, he intends to turn into Hyde and go do these things, but Hyde is 100% evil. So instead of doing these minor things that Jekyll might do, Hyde is going to, I don't know, cruise around in elementary school in an unmarked white van or um, murder a guy or trample a girl. You know, like Hyde does evil because he's 100% evil. There's not even a little bit of good. There's no conscience inside his head that tells him, no, you shouldn't do this thing because that conscience has been removed, right? So, uh, but Jekyll doesn't feel guilty for what Hyde's done. Even though he did it himself, he did it as Hyde. And even though he has all the memories of doing it inside his head, he doesn't feel like it's him that did them. And so it's a really interesting situation that Stevenson has engineered here for us. Uh, anyway, back to our story. Into the details of the infamy at which I thus connive, for even now I can scarce grant that I committed it. I have no design of entering. I mean but to point out the warnings and the successive steps with which my chastisement approached. I met with one accident which, as it brought on no consequence, I shall no more than mention. An act of cruelty to a child aroused against me the anger of a passerby whom I recognized the other day in the person of your kinsman. This is the story of a door chapter. We're finally getting into an overlap with the actual story and when the story started. Uh, so if you're if you're looking to place all of these events on a timeline of Jekyll's life, all the stuff up to here happened before the story even started. Now we're engaging with chapter one of the story, the story of a door. Um, I recognize the other day in the person of your kinsman, sorry, passerby whom I, yeah, the doctor and the child's family joined him. There were moments when I feared for my life, and at last, in order to pacify their too just resentment, Edward Hyde had to bring them to the door. 
and pay them in a check drawn on the name of Henry Jekyll. But this danger was easily eliminated from the future by opening an account at another bank in the name of Edward Hyde himself. And when, by sloping my own handwriting backward, I had supplied my double with a signature, ah, this explains the note and the signatures and the handwriting and why he had a bank account and the checkbook, a lot of the pieces are starting to fall into place. I thought I sat beyond the reach of fate. Some two months before the murder of Sir Danvers, so that's chapter four, I had been out for one of my adventures. I had returned at a late hour and woke the next day in bed with somewhat odd sensations. I, it was in vain that I looked about me, in vain that I saw the decent furniture and tall proportions of my room in the square, in vain that I recognized the pattern of the bed curtains and the design of the mahogany frame. Something still kept insisting that I was not where I was, that I had not wakened where I seemed to be, but in the little room in Soho where I was accustomed to sleep in the body of Edward Hyde. I smiled to myself, and in my psychological way began lazily to inquire into the elements of this illusion, occasionally, even as I did so, dropping back into a comfortable doze. I was still so engaged when, in one of my more wakeful moments, my eyes fell upon my hand. No. The hand of Henry Jekyll, as you have often remarked, was professional in shape and size. It was large, firm, white, and comely. But the hand which I now saw clearly enough in the yellow light of a mid-London morning, lying half shut on the bedclothes, was lean, corded, and corded, knuckly of a dusky pallor, and thickly shaded with a swart growth of hair. It was the hand of Edward Hyde. Ah. Jekyll goes out one night as Hyde, and engages in a lot of fun activities. He comes back, takes a potion, turns back into Jekyll, and goes to bed. Without taking the potion the next morning, he wakes up, feeling kind of weird, looking around his room. You ever wake up early in the morning, you slowly watch the sun rise on the walls of your room. That's sort of what he's doing. And then he looks down at his hand and realizes that it's not Jekyll's hand. It's Hyde's hand. This is important because he went to bed as Jekyll, and without taking the potion, he woke up as Hyde. I must have stared upon it for nearly half a minute, sunk as I was in the mere stupidity of wonder, before terror woke up in my breast as sudden and startling as a clash of cymbals, and bounding from my bed I rushed to the mirror. At the sight that met my eyes, I lost my spot. My blood was changed into something exquisitely thin and icy. Yes, I had gone to bed Henry Jekyll, and I had awakened as Edward Hyde. How was this to be explained, I asked myself, and then, to, with another bound of terror, how was it to be remedied? It was well on in the morning, the servants were up, all my drugs were in the cabinet, a long journey down two pairs of stairs, through the back passage, across the open court, and through the anatomical theater from where I was then standing, horror struck. It might have deed it be possible to cover my face, but of what use was that when I was unable to conceal the alteration of my stature? And then, with an overpowering sweetness of relief, it came back upon my mind that the servants were already used to the coming and going of my second self. I had soon dressed as well as I was able in clothes of my own size, had soon passed through the house where Bradshaw stared and drew back at seeing Mr. Hyde at such an hour in such a strange array, and ten minutes later Dr. Jekyll had returned to his own shape and was sitting down with a darkened brow to make a feint of breakfasting. Small indeed was my appetite. This inexplicable incident, this reversal of my previous experience, seemed like the Babylonian finger on the wall to be spelling out the letters of my judgment, and I began to reflect more seriously than ever before on the issues and possibilities of my double existence. That part of me, which I had had the power of projecting, had lately been much exercised and nourished. It had seemed to me of late as though the body of Edward Hyde had grown in stature as though, when I wore that form, I were conscious of a more generous tide of blood, and I began to spy a danger that, if this were much prolonged, the balance of my nature might be permanently overthrown, the power of voluntary change be forfeited, and the character of Edward Hyde become irrevocably mine. Interesting. So, if you will, uh, Jekyll is concerned that the balance of his soul is shifting. As it was, he had spent his life, he said, nine-tenths a life of good and 10% a life of evil. And so 90% of his soul was good and 10% of his soul was evil. Imagine a balance being here, or, or scales. Um, but as he continues to do evil as Hyde, it turns out that Hyde is part of himself. And so that balance, 90-10, has maybe shifted significantly. Maybe it's even shifted to 51-49. And the reason he turned into Hyde hide while he was asleep was because 
a greater percentage of his soul is now evil than good. What happens when too much of it changes? What happens when there's not enough Jekyll left to manifest himself at all? Will Jekyll disappear entirely? This is maybe a poetic justice moment. Um, there's an allusion to the Babylonian finger on the wall pointing at him. Um, anyway, I began to spy a danger that, if this were much prolonged, the balance of my nature might be permanently overthrown, the power of voluntary change forfeited, and the character of Edward Hyde become irrevocably mine. The power of the drug had not been always equally displayed. Once, very early in my career, it had totally failed me. Since then, I had been obliged on more than one occasion to double, and once with infinite risk of death, to triple the amount, and these rare uncertainties had cast hitherto the sole shadow on my contentment. Now, however, and in light of this morning's accident, I was led to remark that whereas, in the beginning, the difficulty had been to throw off the body of Jekyll, it had of late gradually but decidedly transferred itself to the other side. All things, therefore, seemed to point to this that I was slowly losing hold of my original and better self, and becoming slowly incorporated with my second and worse. Between these two I now felt I had to choose. My two natures had memory in common, but all other faculties were most unequally shared between them. Jekyll, who was composite, made of good and evil, now with the most sensitive apprehensions, now with a greedy gusto, projected and shared in the pleasures and adventures of Hyde. But Hyde was indifferent to Jekyll, or but remembered him as the mountain bandit remembers the cavern in which he conceals himself from pursuit. Jekyll had more than a father's interest. Hyde had more than a son's indifference. To cast in my lot with Jekyll was to die to those appetites which I had long secretly indulged and of late began to pamper. To cast in with Hyde was to die to a thousand interests, aspirations, and to become, at a blow and forever, despised and friendless. The bargain might appear unequal, but there was still another consideration in the scales, for while Jekyll would suffer smartingly in the fires of abstinence, Hyde would not even be conscious of all he had lost. Strange as my circumstances were, the terms of this debate are as old and commonplace as man. Much the same inducements and alarms cast the die for any tempted and trembling sinner, and it fell out with me as it falls out with so vast a majority of my fellows that I chose the better part and was found wanting the strength to keep it. So, uh, he ends up with this choice. He feels like if he, if he keeps turning it to Hyde, eventually Hyde is going to become his entire personality. He's going to lose Jekyll entirely. And this is sort of terrifying, but he starts thinking about it rationally, and, um, you know, Jekyll's 50-50. He's got good and bad sides. He enjoys, on some level, the things that Hyde does. And if he decides to be Jekyll for the rest of his life, he's always going to want to do those things. Uh, and he's always going to be aware of what he's missing. Whereas if he turns into Hyde, Hyde will not even be conscious of the good because it's completely not part of his personality. So he will not have any regrets. That's interesting. Also, you know, while... Jekyll is very conscious of Hyde. Hyde doesn't think about Jekyll except as a place of refuge, a place he can run to and hide in. This is probably where Hyde got his name right. I'm going to call him Edward Hyde. Ha, 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 because I can hide inside me. Right, but it's interesting. So he decides he's going to be Jekyll, but he says he was found wanting the strength to keep his resolution. Yes, I preferred the elderly and discontented doctor, surrounded by friends and cherishing honest hopes, and bade a resolute farewell to the liberty, the comparative youth, the light step, leaping impulses, and secret pleasures that I had enjoyed in the disguise of Hyde. I made this choice, perhaps, with some unconscious reservation, for I neither gave up the house in Soho, nor destroyed the clothes of Edward Hyde, which still lay ready in my cabinet. <laughs> yeah, what a good job you did, Jekyll. I mean, it's like the... the I don't know, drunk who's like, I'm never going to drink again. I'll just keep all my alcohol under the bed. Why do you keep the house? Why do you keep the clothes? If you're never going to be Hyde again, why do this? You know, clearly he wasn't very dedicated to his decision. For two months, however, I was true to my determination. For two months, I led a life of such severity as I had never before attained to, and enjoyed the compensations of an approved conscience. But time began at last to obliterate the freshness of my alarm. The praises of conscience began to grow into a thing of course, and I began to be tortured with throes and longings as of Hyde struggling after freedom. And at last, in an hour of moral weakness, I once again compounded and swallowed the transforming draught. 
I do not suppose that when a drunkard reasons with himself upon his vice, he is one out of five hundred times affected by the dangers that he runs through in his brutish physical insensibility. Neither had I, as long as I had considered my position, made enough allowance for the complete moral insensibility and insensate readiness to evil which were the leading characters of Edward Hyde. Yet it was by these that I was punished. My devil had long been caged. He came out roaring. I was conscious, even when I took the draft, of a more unbridled, a more furious propensity to ill. I, it must have been this, I suppose, that stirred in my soul that tempest of impatience with which I listened to the civilities of my unhappy victim. Ah, the Carew murder, that's where we are here. Um, apparently, you know, Jekyll had made this promise that he was never going to turn into Hyde again, and he resisted turning into Hyde for two months, but Hyde was getting angrier and angrier inside of Jekyll and wanting to get out, and so when finally Jekyll gives in, Hyde comes out super angry and super evil, ready to do something new and exciting, um, and here he is talking to Carew. I listened to the civilities of my unhappy victim. I declare, at least before God, no man morally sane could have been guilty of that crime upon so pitiful a provocation and that I struck in no more reasonable spirit than that in which a sick child may break a plaything. But I had voluntarily stripped myself of all those balancing instincts by which even the worst of us continues to walk with some degree of steadiness upon, among temptations. And in my case, to be tempted however slightly was to fall. So he's like, look, every other human being in the world has conscience, and anybody with even an ounce of conscience wouldn't have beat Carew to death, but Hyde... He doesn't have a conscience. His mind says, let's murder this guy. And he's like, okay, because there's no second voice that's telling him not to do it. Instantly, the spirit of hell awoke in me and raged. With a transport of glee, I mauled the unresisting body, tasting delight from every blow. And it was not till weariness had begun to succeed that I was suddenly, in the top fit of my delirium, struck through the heart by a cold thrill of terror. A mist dispersed. I saw my life to be forfeit, and fled from the scene of these excesses, at once glorying and trembling, my lust of evil gratified and stimulated, my love of life screwed to the topmost peg. I ran to the house in Soho, and, to make assurance doubly sure, I don't know if you're uh, familiar with uh, these kinds of things, but I believe that's a Macbeth reference. There's a couple of them here. Um, my love of life screwed to the topmost peg. I know that Lady Macbeth says, screw your courage to the sticking point. Um, so there's some interesting connections here. Macbeth is a story, a Shakespearean story in which um, a man and his wife commit a murder and then try and cover it up. And so here is Hyde doing the same thing. Um, I ran to my house in Soho and, to make assurance doubly sure, destroyed my papers. Thence I set out through the lamplit streets in the same divided ecstasy of mind, gloating on my crime, light-headedly devising others in the future, and yet still hastening and still hearkening in my wake for the steps of the Avenger. Hyde had a song upon his lips as he compounded the draft, and as he drank it, he pledged the dead man. Wow. So Hyde is thinking about other murders that he can commit, other great, fun activities that he can do. Um, after destroying his house, he goes back to Jekyll's house, and he makes the potion, and he's like, here's to you, dead guy, and then drinks it. Um, the pangs of transformation had not done tearing him before Henry Jekyll, with streaming tears of gratitude and remorse, had fallen upon his knees and lifted his clasped hands to God. The veil of self-indulgence was rent from head to foot. I saw my life as a whole. I followed it up from the days of childhood when I had walked with my father's hand, and through the self-denying toils of my professional life to arrive again and again with the same sense of unreality at the damned horrors of the evening. I could have screamed aloud. I sought with tears and prayers to smother down the crowd of hideous images and sounds with which my memory swarmed against me, and still between the petitions the ugly face of my iniquity stared into my soul. As the acuteness of this remorse began to die away, it was succeeded by a sense of joy. The problem of my conduct was solved. Hyde was thenceforth impossible. Whether I would or not, I was now confined to the better part of my existence, and oh, how I rejoiced to think of it! With what willing humility I embraced anew the restrictions of natural life! With what sincere renunciation I locked the door by which I had gone so often, and ground the key under my heel! Ah, lots of interesting things here. So, Hyde kills Carew, goes back and turns into Jekyll, and Jekyll's overcome because his memory, he can remember doing the murder. 
can remember breaking the bones and all the horrible things that went along with it, and he's sort of overwhelmed by it. But, you know, everything wears off after time, and after enough time has gone by, he starts to feel like this was the best thing that could have happened to him, because now Hyde's a wanted murderer. If he ever turns back into Hyde, he can get captured and hanged by the neck until dead as punishment for his crime. And so he has to stay gentle. Hyde can't possibly be an option anymore. And so he was happy about this. Uh, he took that key and broke it. This is the key that they found that was rusty. There's no way out of that back door anymore. The next day came the news that the murder had not been overlooked, that the guilt of Hyde was patent to the world, and that the victim was a man high in public estimation. It was not only a crime, it had been a tragic folly. I think I was glad to know it. I think I was glad to have my better impulses thus buttressed and guarded by the terrors of the scaffold. The scaffold is the hangman's noose, right? Um, it's the platform upon which you stand to be hanged. Jekyll was now my city of refuge, as a metaphor. Let but Hyde peep out for an instant, and the hands of all men would be raised to take and slay him. I resolved in my future conduct to redeem the past, and I can say with honesty that my resolve was fruitful of some good. You know yourself how earnestly in the last months of last year I labored to relieve suffering. You know that much was done for others, and that the days passed quietly almost happily for myself. Nor can I truly say that I wearied of this beneficent and innocent life. I think instead that I daily enjoyed it more completely. But I was still cursed with my duality of purpose, and as the first edge of my penitence wore off, the lower side of me, so long indulged, so recently chained down, began to growl for license. Not that I dreamed of resuscitating Hyde. The bare idea of that would startle me to frenzy. No, it was in my own person that I was once more tempted to trifle with my conscience, and it was as an ordinary secret sinner that I at last fell before the assaults of temptation. So, um, we're getting down to something important here, I think. That was my phone. Um, but what's going on here is, uh, remember the two months that Jekyll got religion and was super charitable and out in public? This is the two months after the Carew murder case. Immediately after that, uh, remember that he had a party at which he invited Jekyll and Lanyon. And then um, the incident of Dr. Lanyon happened where Lanyon got sick and died. And we already heard about that in the letter. So we're getting down towards the later stuff, the later chapters. Um, and he does say that he at last fell before the assaults of temptation. So he started feeling like he wanted to be evil again. Not that he was going to turn into Hyde, but just that he wanted to be evil as Jekyll. How does this turn out? And there comes an end to all things. The most capacious measure is filled at last, and this brief condescension to my evil finally destroyed the balance of my soul. And yet I was not alarmed. The fall seemed natural, like a return to the old days before I had made my discovery. It was a fine, clear January day, wet underfoot where the frost had melted, but cloudless overhead. And the Regent's Park was full of winter chirpings and sweet with spring odors. I sat in the sun on the bench, the animal within me licking the chops of memory, the spiritual side a little drowsed, promising subsequent penitence, but not yet moved to begin. After all, I reflected, I was like my neighbors, and then I smiled, comparing myself with other men, comparing my active goodwill with the lazy cruelty of their neglect. And at the very moment of that vainglorious thought, a qualm came over me, a horrid nausea and the most deadly shuddering. These passed away and left me faint, and then, as in its turn fit this faintness subsided, I began to be aware of a change in the temper of my thoughts, a greater boldness a contempt of danger, a solution of the bonds of obligation. I looked down. My clothes hung formlessly on my shrunken limbs. The hand that lay on my knee was corded and hairy. I was once more Edward Hyde. A moment before, I had been safe of all men's respect, wealthy, beloved, the cloth laying for me in the dining room at home, and now I was the common quarry of mankind, hunted, houseless, a known murderer, thrall to the gallows. So, he, he went to the park, and he was sitting in the park, and he was dwelling on the fun things he had done as Hyde and thinking about his life. And then, he, and then he thought about, you know, how he was doing so much good in the world, you know, now that he had recovered from, you know, the murder or whatever else he had done. Um, he was being charitable and helping people out, and he was like, I am so much better than other people because I'm actively helping it out. And most people just feel like they want to help people out, but they never actually do anything. And this is the vainglorious thought that ultimately 
changes the balance of his soul. He was sitting at 49% evil, 51% good. Now he's 51% evil, 49% good, and his natural state is hide. He shudders, he transforms in public, on a bench, into hide. Hyde is a wanted murderer. Everybody's looking for him. It's daytime. He's outside. He's broken the key. He can't get back into his house without going through the house itself. But all of his servants know Hyde, and they know that Hyde is a murderer, and they would simply turn him into the police. So now he's got this really, really difficult situation on his hands. How does it all turn out? My reason wavered, but it did not fail me utterly. I have more than once observed that in my second character my faculties seemed sharpened to a point, and my spirits more tensely elastic. Thus it came about that where Jekyll perhaps might have succumbed, Hyde rose to the importance of the moment. My drugs were in one of the presses in my cabinet. How was I then to reach them? That was a problem that, crushing my temples in my hands, I set myself to solve. The laboratory door I had closed. If I sought to enter by the house, my own servants would consign me to the gallows. I saw I must employ another hand and thought of Lanyon. How was he to be reached? How persuaded? Supposing that I escaped capture in the streets, how was I to make my way into his presence? And how should I, an unknown and displeasing visitor, prevail on the famous physician to rifle the study of his colleague Dr. Jekyll? Then I remembered that of my original character, one part remained to me. I could still write my own handwriting. And once I had conceived that kindling spark, the way that I must follow became lighted up from end to end. Thereupon I arranged my clothes as best I could, and summoning a passing hansom, drove to a hotel in Portland Street, the name of which I chanced to remember. At my appearance, which was indeed comical enough, however tragic the fate these garments covered, the driver could not conceal his mirth. I gnashed my teeth upon him, with a gust of devilish fury, and the smile withered from his face. Happily for him, yet more happily for myself, for in another instant I had certainly dragged him from his perch. At the inn, as I entered, I looked about me with so black a countenance and made the attendants tremble. Not a look did they exchange in my presence, but obsequiously took my orders, and led me to a private room, and brought me wherewithal to write. Hyde, in danger of his life, was a creature new to me, shaken with inordinate anger, strung to the pitch of murder, lusting to inflict pain, yet the creature was astute mastered his fury with a great effort of the will, composed his two important letters, one to Lanyon and one to Poole, and, that he might receive actual evidence of their being posted, sent them out with directions that they should be registered. Ah, uh, remember he had signed for the envelope, so that's what's going on there. Thenceforward he sat all day over the fire in the private room, gnawing his nails. There he dined, sitting alone with his fears, the waiter visibly quailing before his eye, and thence, when the night was fully come, he set forth in the corner of a closed cab, and was driven to and fro about the streets of the city. He, I say, I cannot say I, that child of hell had nothing human, nothing lived in him but fear and hatred. And when at last, thinking the driver had begun to grow suspicious, he discharged the cab and ventured on foot, attired in his misfitting clothes, an object marked out for observation into the midst of the nocturnal passengers, these two base passions, in this case, uh, what was it, fear and hatred, raged within him like a tempest. He walked fast, hunted by his fears, chattering to himself, skulking through the less frequented thoroughfares, counting, him, counting the minutes that still divided him from midnight. Once a woman spoke to him, offering, I think, a box of lights, he smote her on the face, and she fled. So apparently some poor woman's like, Would you like to buy some matches, sir? And Hyde just hauls off and punches her in the face. And she runs away. It's the kind of guy that somebody's like, Hey, would you like to buy some matches? And he just... Uh, when I came to myself at Lanyon's... Ah, so we're at the end of the last chapter here. The horror of my old friend perhaps affected me somewhat. I do not know. It was, at least, but a drop in the sea of abhorrence with which I looked back upon these hours. A change had come over me. It was no longer the fear of the gallows, it was the horror of being Hyde that racked me. I received Lanyon's condemnation, partly in a dream. It was partly in a dream that I came home to my own house and got into bed. I slept after the pros prostration of the day with a stringent and profound slumber, which not even the nightmares that were wrung that wrung me could avail to break. I awoke in the morning, shaken, weakened, but refreshed. I still hated and feared the thought of the brute that slept within me, and I had not, of course, forgotten the appalling dangers of the day before, but I was once more at home, in my own house and close to my drugs, and gratitude for my escape shone so strong in my soul that it almost rivaled the brightness of hope. 
I was stepping leisurely across the court after, after breakfast, drinking the chill of the air with pleasure when I was seized again with the indescribable sensations that heralded the change, and I had but the time to gain the shelter of my cabinet before I was once again raging and freezing with the passions of Hyde. So the next day after breakfast he turns into Hyde again, without anything that happened, happened to uh, indicate that it was going to occur. It took on this occasion a double dose to recall me to myself, and alas, six hours after, as I sat looking sadly in the fire, the pangs returned, and the drug had to be re-administered. In short, from that day forth, it seemed only by a great effort, as of gymnastics, and only under the immediate stimulation of the drug, that I was able to wear the countenance of Jekyll. At all hours of the day and night, I would be taken with the premonitory shudder. Above all, if I slept or even dozed for a moment in my chair, it was always as Hyde that I awakened. So every time he goes to sleep, he wakes up as Hyde. Under the, so he, he must be denying himself sleep. Can you imagine the sleeplessness that he's got going on? Under the strain of this continually impending doom, and by the sleeplessness to which I now condemn myself, I, even beyond what I had thought possible to man, I became in my own person a creature eaten up and emptied by fever, languidly weak both in body and mind, and solely occupied by one thought, the horror of my other self. But when I slept, or when the virtue of the medicine wore off, I would leap almost without transition, for the pangs of transformation grew daily less marked, into the possession of a fancy brimming with images of terror, a soul boiling with causeless hatreds, and a body that seemed not strong enough to contain the raging energies of life. The powers of Hyde seemed to have grown with the sickliness of Jekyll, and certainly the hate that now divided them was equal on each side. With Jekyll it was a thing of vital instinct. He had now seen the full deformity of that creature that shared with him some of the phenomena of consciousness, and was co-heir with him to death. And beyond these links of common community, which in themselves made the most poignant part of his distress, he thought of Hyde, for all his energy of life, as something not only hellish but inorganic. This was the shocking thing, that the slime of the pit seemed to utter cries and voices, that the amorphous dust gesticulated and sinned, that what was dead and had no shape should usurp the offices of life. This is an interesting bit, and, and uh, it's been speculated that maybe this is a, a sort of a speculation on, on the idea of multiple personality disorders, when some, some personality, a hated personality, slowly takes over um, somebody's body and then does things that they, they wouldn't do themselves, and then they come to, it's, it's like a piece of themselves that doesn't even exist it's in reality is, is doing these things, and that's the fear that um, Jekyll has of Hyde, um, which is super disturbing. Uh, and the only commonalities that they have, I'm looking for the, the bit here, the only links of community that they have is that, that uh, they share some of the phenomena of consciousness. They see out of the same eyes, they hear out of the same ears, they have the same memories, and they're co-heir to death. They both die if the body dies. That's going to tie in with the, the suicide of Hyde at the end of the story. Um, where was I? And this again, that the insurgent horror was knit to him closer than a wife, closer than an eye, lay caged in his flesh where he heard it mutter and felt it struggle to be born, and at every hour of weakness, and in the confidence of slumber, prevailed against him and deposed him out of life. The hatred of Hyde for Jekyll was of a different order. His terror of the gallows drove him to continually commit temporary suicide and return to his subordinate station of a part instead of a person. But he loathed the necessity. He loathed the despondency into which Jekyll was now fallen, and he resented the dislike with which he was himself regarded. Hence the ape-like, there's another ape word, tricks that he would play on me, scrawling in my own handwriting blasphemies on the pages of my books, burning the letters and destroying the portrait of my father, and indeed, had it not been for his fear of death, he would have long ago ruined himself in order to involve me in ruin. But his love of life is wonderful. I go further. I, who sicken and freeze at the mere thought of him, when I recall the abjection and passion of this attachment, and when I know he fears my power to cut him off by suicide, I find it in my heart to pity him. It is useless, and the time awfully fails me, to prolong this description. No one has ever suffered such torments. Let that suffice. And yet, even to these, habit brought... No not alleviation, but a certain callousness of soul, a certain acquiescence of despair, and my punishment might have gone on for years, but for the last calamity which has now fallen, and which has finally severed me from my own face and nature. My provision of the salt, which had never been renewed since the date of the first experiment, began to run low, 
I sent out for a fresh supply and mix the draft. That evolution followed. Oh, hold on, that's my phone. And then the first change of color, not the second. I drank it, and it was without efficacy. You will learn from Poole how I have had London ransacked. It was in vain. And I am now persuaded that my first supply was impure, and that it was the unknown impurity which lent efficacy to the draft. That's important. What's interesting here is that um, Jekyll's experiment worked initially because there was some unknown impurity in the salt that he ordered, and it was the unknown impurity that sort of by chance allowed the um, experiment to work in the first place. And now he doesn't know what that impurity is, and he's used up all of the salt, and uh, he's in a very difficult situation. Because remember, he naturally turns into Hyde at this point. So how is he going to maintain Jekyll if he can't remake the potion? And of course, this explains what, what goes on with Poole running all around London. <clears throat> About a week has passed, and I am now finishing this statement under the influence of the last of the old powders. This, then, is the last time, short of a miracle, that Henry Jekyll can think his own thoughts, or see his own face, now how sadly altered in the glass. Nor must I delay too long in bringing my writing to an end, for if my narrative has hitherto escaped destruction, it has been by a combination of great prudence and great good luck. Should the throes of change take me in the act of writing it, Hyde will tear it in pieces. But if some time shall have elapsed after I have laid it by, his wonderful selfishness and circumspection to the moment will probably save it once again from the action of his ape-like tricks. And indeed, the doom that is closing on us both has already changed and crushed him. Half an hour from now, when I shall again and forever re that hated personality, I know how I shall sit. <clears throat> I can read. How I shall sit shuddering and weeping in my chair, or continue with the most strained and fear-struck ecstasy of listening to pace up and down this room, my last earthly refuge, and give ear to every sound of menace. Will Hyde die upon the scaffold? Or will he find courage to release himself at the last moment? God knows, I am careless. This is my true hour of death. And what is to follow concerns another than myself. Here, then, as I lay down the pen and proceed to seal up my confession, I bring the life of that unhappy Henry Jekyll to an end. All right, this is an hour long, so I'm just going to stop it. Uh, if you have questions or comments, you can put it below, but I will record an analysis of this uh, final chapter in Lanyon's um, and the story as a whole uh, and, and have that ready for you next. Thanks.